You say Los Angeles, you say period, you say mystery, and every movie lover's head is filled with images from The Big Sleep or Chinatown or Out of the Past or those great you know, film noirs from the 40s. I love those pictures, but I wanted L.A. Confidential to be something different. And L.A. Confidential was something different. It was a contemporary yet believable rendering of the city as it was. The film offered 1990s moviegoers a lived-in 1950s world that avoided the slick, glossy, and over-stylized and romanticized look of a lot of 1990s period dramas. As a noir, the film wasn't an outlier. Noir had made a comeback in the 1990s with films like One False Move, Devil in a Blue Dress, both directed by Carl Franklin and both I highly recommend you check out if you haven't seen, Basic Instinct, The Grifters, and The Last Seduction, all released in the five years before L.A. Confidential. Based on the novel by James Elroy, L.A. Confidential is a thickly plotted, some may even say overstuffed work, and the third novel of Elroy's L.A. Quartet series, preceded by The Black Dahlia and The Big Nowhere, and followed by the final book, White Jazz. Directed by Curtis Hansen, with the screenplay by Brian Hegeland, the story is set in the early 1950s and revolves around the dark underbelly of Los Angeles, where corruption and crime run rampant, and follows three very different Los Angeles police officers as they uncover a web of corruption and deceit. There's Ed Exley, the by-the-books ambitious police officer, ready to do whatever it takes to climb the department ladder. Bud White, a tough and violent enforcer with a soft spot for abused women. And Jack Vincennes, a swab narcotics detective who moonlights as the technical director on a popular dragnet-like TV show called Badge of Honor. As these three officers become entangled in a complex and dangerous investigation, they discover connections between a brutal mass murder at a coffee shop. The Night Owl Massacre. Hyperbole aside, this is a heinous crime that requires swift resolution. Six victims. One of them, one of our own. A high-end prostitution ring. Fleur de lis whatever you desire. And powerful figures in the police force and entertainment industry. Yeah, finding 25 pounds of heroin would we'll get you plenty of ink. The film delves deep into their personal and professional struggles as they navigate a world filled with moral ambiguity, betrayal, and intrigue. And it's a dark and twisted mystery that takes us from studio sets to glamorous homes to the city seedy underbelly. This is a time and place where there is a very thin line between the cops and the criminals. Anyone who has read the novel knows that the film is not a faithful adaptation. In fact, I would say that any adaptation of this work would be hard-pressed to be faithful unless given the runtime of a miniseries. The novel is heavily plotted with dozens of characters. In fact, there are so many characters, it's sometimes hard to keep them straight. The legendary Preston Exley. They call me Buzz. Hello, Karen. My one is Deuce Perkins. Meyer Harris Cohen. Brown and Helenowski. Johnny Stump Banana. And like the film, the story spans the years from 1953 to 1958. And all the strands of corruption and murder and plot twists and turns weave themselves back and forth through history. But beyond the hard-boiled characters, the corruption and the crime, what anchors the film and the book is the city of Los Angeles. Pretty, isn't she? The third largest city in the country. And she's quite a lady. Kind of peaceful, too, in the warm, friendly light of day. But when the light goes down and the city is dark, its back streets and brooding alleys become a jungle. On the outside, Los Angeles at mid-20th century was America's golden city of progress, the city of tomorrow. It's the city of the future. It was the place of Hollywood glamour, car culture, and a suburban paradise. L.A. was moving forward faster than any other place in the country, and it prided itself on its embrace of progress. But Los Angeles was, and still is, a place that never holds on too long to its past. It wipes away its history and its people without reverence or remorse. 
the important job of recreating Los Angeles at mid-century was given to head production designer Janine Openwall. And in his brief to Openwall and her production team, director Curtis Hansen stated that they were not making a Raymond Chandler movie because Chandler was the world of the 30s and the 40s. This was about the 50s, the forward-looking 50s. Rather than screening film noir classics for visual inspiration, Hansen and cinematographer Dante Spinotti poured over the work of Swiss-born still photographer Robert Frank. They were particularly interested in Frank's 1958 book, The Americans, a collection of gritty, startling black and white photographs documenting American life during the mid-50s. Like Frank's photographs, Hansen's Los Angeles would have no haze of nostalgia. Nostalgia. He was determined everything about the movie would be contemporary, except for the sets and the wardrobe. He wanted to create a hybrid style, one where the past was seen as something thinly veiled over today. And yet to find locations in this city that would both serve the action and also give us a look that we liked aesthetically was just an enormous challenge because Los Angeles is a city where everywhere you look, things have been bulldozed to make a buck. And the world Open Wall and her team created was one that spanned from the ordinary and mundane with stripped down scenes of everyday life and true modest lived in interiors to architectural displays of LA wealth and glamour with styles that look forward and backwards and familiar landscapes that bridge the past to the future. And then the dark side. Murder drenched in neon lights, seedy hotels, and grimy hideouts on Bunker Hill. And an abandoned 1920s roadside stop, the Victory Motel, the only location constructed from the ground up. Janine built our Victory Motel there. We were able to pick the place to put it, and it spoke to everything that was going on in Los Angeles, both the beauty of the natural landscape and also the exploitation of that landscape. Hollywood itself is a quiet, well-behaved little town with a greatly exaggerated reputation for notoriety. In the film and book The Scandal Rag, Hush Hush Magazine, a very real magazine similar to Confidential, operates outside the manufactured publicity machine of the Hollywood studios, working to rip off the veneer of the town's respectability and shattering the illusions built by the dream factories and L.A. City boosters, shattering the myth and revealing to the American public just how deeply seedy and corrupt the place really was. In his four-star review of the film, Roger Ebert noted that for contemporary audiences, it is hard to imagine a time when crime and vice lived hidden in the shadows, but they did. And the tipping point when that era ended, it must have been in the early 1950s with the rise of instant celebrities, scandalous tabloid magazines like Confidential, and the partnership between Hollywood and law enforcement agencies, and the end of the media's reticence about seedy subject matters. L.A. Confidential shows the current era of sensationalism being born. Hold it. Got it. Want an autograph? Write to MGM. Got it. Tell Mr. Patchett that I have no intention of changing my vote. Got it. They're living the dream. The reality was 20th century Los Angeles watched its Japanese residents get herded off into internment camps, removed Mexican-Americans from their homes in Chavez Ravine, and suffered from two racially charged riots, both in response to the racist practices of the LAPD. There was Sleepy Lagoon, Patricia Douglas, Brenda Allen, Boyle Heights, Bloody Christmas, studio cover-ups, and police corruption. Andrew Taylor, writing for Collider, observed that Los Angeles doesn't always do a great job portraying itself on film. For over 100 years, the city's main export has sold audiences on L.A. sun-kissed beaches, idyllic suburbs, and starlet-filled mansions in the Hollywood Hills, a vision that conveniently glosses over much of the city's grimy underbelly. L.A. Confidential is the most notable exception and remains the most genuine, holistic depiction of Los Angeles on film an unblinking showcase of the city for what it is, a beautiful, fabricated megalopolis in the desert that, while drenched in sunshine and celebrity, is also built on the foundation of corruption, racism, 
and exploitation of the starry-eyed dreamers who wash up on its shores every day. And when compared to the book, the film sanitizes that. The book is sensational, it's explicit, and it's grotesque. And it does a much better job of exploring this dark side, the casual racism, homophobia, the ubiquitous drug use, the institutional police brutality and corruption. When initially asked about a film adaptation, Elroy said, we thought this movie was adaptation proof. It was big, it was bad, it was bereft of sympathetic characters. It was unconstrained, uncontainable, and unadaptable. Elroy really loves his alliteration. And he's right, due to the sheer scope of the book, it was necessary for the film to discard or downplay many plot threads. It simplifies the personalities of the book's three main characters. Bud White, in the novel, is smarter than the film gives him credit for. He's also more violent, more prone to explosive rage. Side note, James Elroy is on the record as saying that Bud White is boyfriend of the channel. Sterling Hayden's character, Detective Lieutenant Sims, from the 1954 film Crime Wave. Ed Exley in the book is more calculating, ambitious, and even more unlikable. And Jack Vincennes is a drug addict with an extremely dark past and a kink for violent smut. The film also misses the chance to juxtapose the glamorous, protected world of Lynn Bracken, who works as a high-class Veronica-like look-alike call girl, from the violent, abusive, and predatory world of the average street prostitute. The one character that actually seems to make the full transition from book to screen is Dudley Smith. James Cromwell's Dudley Smith is the embodiment of the crooked cop. He is very much at home with using violence, and he's okay brutalizing and trampling on the rights of suspects. The film also just teases at Elroy's brutal depiction of just how cheap the lives of those on the fringes really are. They're expendable. They're worth far less than money, ambition, highways, water, automobiles, and baseball stadiums. New York noir is obvious, right? It's tenements, it's your too many rats in the cage. That's, that's the story, okay? But in Los Angeles, it's, it's more subtle because it's the wide open spaces. It's sunny. But having said that, it makes the darker aspects all the more bitter because you've been led to believe in something else. That's whisked away and this rot is revealed beneath. L.A. Confidential is really a spiritual successor to the classic noir of double indemnity, crime wave, act of violence, the big sleep, and the neo-noir films like Chinatown and Farewell, My Lovely. So even though Curtis Hansen didn't want to look to the past for explicit inspiration, the past is in the film's DNA, in the very history of the city where the story is told, and in every dark corner and twist of fate, tough guy and dangerous woman, from every crime film set in the City of Angels. Forget it, Jake, it's Chinatown. There are 8 million stories in the cinema cities. This has been one. Hey guys, a huge shout out to my monthly channel supporters. Your names are featured here. Thank you. If you'd like to support the channel, check out the links below. Los Angeles, Los Angeles, Los Angeles. <laughs>